And Lorenzo is currently doing his PhD under the supervision of Professor Vitor Cardoso. He completed his bachelor and master in Università La Sapienza of Rome under the supervision of uh, Professor Leonardo Gualtieri. His topics of interest are black hole and compact object physics and alternative theories with a special focus on scalar fields. Today, he will talk about the dynamical behavior of bottom stars and dark matter cores. So, um, Lorenzo, you have 45 minutes. Uh, I will tell you when there's, I don't know, 10 minutes uh, left. I kindly ask everyone to keep their mic microphone muted unless you have to um, stop Lorenzo and make questions and see you all at the end of the, of the talk. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for the kind introduction and hope you can uh, listen to me, uh, hear me well and you can see my screen and also my pointer. So for me, it's a, a really great pleasure to be virtually in Trieste. And uh, today I'm going to talk in this CSIFPU webinar about dynamical behavior of boson stars. So the main idea uh, is that we want to use boson stars as dark matter cores at the center of galaxy. And what we want to do is try to stir and shake dark matter to try to see if there is an imprint in the gravitational reaction of these bodies and try to then infer the nature, the ultimate nature of dark matter. At least this is one brick toward this kind of investigation. So let me start with, with, a, with a general motivation. In this nice picture by Anna Kova that I took from the from the Dark Matter Day that basically comes every 31st of October, you can see three black hands that are moving and spinning a pictorial description of galaxies. So in the last century, what we saw is that there are some problems with our model. The cosmological standard model had, needs to take into account the fact that there has to be some extra mass that is not interacting with us and is not emitting light. And we saw this basically through, for instance, the, the rotational curve of galaxies that we were expecting decaying when a star is moving far away from the center of, a, of, a, of a, these galaxies, as the one in the picture. And what we saw is that this is not happening. So one of the possible way, if you don't want to modify the ultimate theory of gravity, that is Einstein, just Einstein general relativity, what, what you need to take into account is some kind of exotic matter. And this picture, I found, it, I found it nice, and also there is some physics, because these hands are making, making the galaxies spin faster than what we are expecting only by looking, so basically with the, uh, optical observatories. All this work is about dark matter, and it's basically we want to we wanna use a model for, for a kind of matter that is just scalar fields to try to mimic the center part of a galaxy, or at least the dark matter part of the center of a galaxy. Uh, this work was carried out together with uh, Professor Cardoso, that is my supervisor, and Rodrigo Vicente, that is a, a PhD colleague that is also supervised by Vitor. Everything I'm going to talk about, at least a part of what I'm talking about, is, is in these two published papers, in which the second part, these are, these are links and you can find it afterwards if you want, uh, it's a, long paper, it's a long paper in which we describe all these possibilities and also we are looking at cue balls as possible toy models for, for boson stars. Together with the motivation, the general motivation about dark matter, I am saying I want to use massive scalar field to mimic dark matter and one can wonder why you want to use that. Well, there are several candidates for dark matter in uh, the history of physics. There are WIMPs, the weakly interactive massive particle, there are much those, there are several ways to try to, to construct this object. But all these kind of particle like dark matter take into account the fact that the De Broglie wavelength of these, of these models is very small, is very small. So basically all the observational consequences of particle like dark matter physics um, explain very well everything above a scale of a kiloparsec, so cosmological scales. But when you arrive to a physics of a galaxy or the internal part of a galaxy, you are left with some problems if you're just using particle like dark matter. For instance, you have that in n-body simulation, cosmologists found that 
uh, that there should be a cusp of dark matter at the center of a galaxy. And with cusp, I mean that the density should grow, for instance, like one over R. So the closer you go to the center of a galaxy, the more density you should find of dark matter. And this should have some kind of observational consequences. In the moment in which you want to use a model that has, that has a massive scalar field, and we saw massive scalars. Well, in 2012, the Higgs bosons, the Higgs bosons is, an, is the first observational example of a scalar field that exists out there in nature. But they were also um, predicted by other, by other kind of branches of physics. For instance, in the Pechai Queen uh, uh, strong um, CP violation in QCD, a massive scalar saves you and give you the correct observational values. Or in the use of astrophysics, uh, in a famous paper by Anfani Taking, uh, we're taking collaborators, there are several massive scalar fields in these axiver scenarios, like the axiom, in fact, that solves the QCD problem and on the other side give you observational consequences for astrophysics. In my study, in our study we call, uh, with collaborators, we use this fuzzy dark matter model. And fuzzy is there because the wavelength of this object is such that it's around a kiloparsec. And this is because the mass of the scalar fields is extremely small compared to the typical masses that there are in the standard model of particle physics. It's around 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. Keep in mind that this is an order of magnitude. There are, of course, different consequences if you go from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 30, up to the Planck scale. But on the other side, 10 to the minus 22 is what we are seeing, we, people expect as having the most um, impact in cosmology, but 10 to the minus 20, 19, 15, some, sometimes they are also good candidates. Another way, and, and another reason why one wants, wants to use, for instance, this FDM model, FASI models, is because the dynamical friction in dwarf galaxies is smaller than, than what is predicted by particle like physics. And we are seeing in dwarf galaxies next to us that some of the cluster of stars should have spiralized at the center just because of dynamical friction. If you take into account that dark matter there is made by scholars, this is not happening. These are all motivations why one, why one wants to use, for instance, this kind of studies. Following one can say, okay, now I have a dark matter structure. And with any structure that you have, one can wonder, is it stable? Can I excite it? Can I see the mode? Can I detect the modes of oscillations of these objects? As was done for black holes several years ago, for instance, or for stars in which the matter information makes the things more complicated. In this case, we have dark matter. So we have something that is somehow collisionless and somehow interacts with with external object only through the gravitational field of, of this, the average gravitational field of the dark matter density. So asking if these objects are stable or the way in which they interact with, uh, with us, with planets, with black holes itself, it's, these are all very interesting questions because the dynamical friction of black holes at the center of galaxies can be estimated in this way instead of the way in which it was done for particle like dark matter physics. And in the last 10 years, we entered the gravitational wave astronomy era. So it's also worth to wonder, is the phase of gravitational wave changing because there is a non-trivial environment around black holes at the center of a galaxy, for instance? Or can we see the decay? Can we see the extra channel of, of radiation due to this scalar that can be depleted by black holes in a, in a way that is similar uh, compared to the halston taylor like experiment. So the loss of orbital period by a binary that is spiralizing in a, inside a, a, a non-trivial environment. These are all questions that I'm trying to, that, that a priori are important. And on the other side, I'm trying to address in, in this talk. Please, if you have any questions, stop me whenever you feel like. So I'm saying massive scalar field. Uh, and one of the reasons is that they are simple. There are, if you consider the time periodic scalar fields, you can have clump of scalar that um, are, are keeping together by their own self gravity, and they can produce this kind, these famous boson stars. And these are there are some kind some a kind of generalization of the Klein Gordon geons predicted by Kaup in 1968. If you are more interested in just in boson stars, there is this. Uh, 
this Liebling and Palenzuela review by in 2012 that is very thoroughly. I was saying that, that, that we need some kind of time periodic scalar field and the reason is that in flat space time you can't have non-topological localized scalar that are keeping together by their own self-gravity and, and this is a famous statement that was found by Derrick in 1964. The theory that we are looking is basically general relativity and you can see because there is this first term in the action that is just the Hilbert Einstein part of the action in which there is the Ricci scalar in here and then we are including matter that is a massive scalar field so the usual, usual kinetical terms phi is the scalar and a mass like potential so mu square so you can have something that is more complicated than this but at first order mu square is what we can in what uh, is the outcome of expanding a more complicated potential that axions can have for instance this t mu nu is just the stress energy of the scalar that that is going to be important in the rest of the perturbation theory that I'm going to do. The equation that comes out by um, varying the action with respect to g mu nu, that is the, the space-time metric, and the field phi, are here on the right, in which in the front, in the first line, you have the Klein-Gordon equation in the space-time g mu nu, in which there is a source term that's basically mu square phi because of the mass of the scalar, and the usual Einstein, Einstein equation in which now there is some kind of matter on the right hand side. If you try at first to say, okay, I want to mimic a dark matter halo. So an object that is mass, the mass, very massive, like 10 to 10 solar masses, but is extended on a very large scale because we're talking about scale of core of a galaxy or even more like a dark matter halo totally. What you need is an object that has a compactness that is very small. It's not like a black hole mimicker. Even if boson stars are used for, as black hole mimickers, for instance, even recently, what we are going to do is just looking at the Newtonian limit of the Einstein-Klein-Gordon equation. And to do this, we need to introduce an ansatz for the scalar field. And in this talk, I'm just referring to, to spherically symmetric so solution for the scalars, this psi of R, with some kind of time periodic dependency that I was mentioning before, in which this gamma is basically the frequency of oscillation of the star. The gravitational, the, the gravitational potential of the object enters in the, li in the line element here. Uh, at first order, is given just by Newtonian potential U. If you plug the ansatz inside the Einstein and Klein-Gordon system, you will arrive to the Schrodinger-Poisson system that is here on the right, in which you can see basically that the scalar field equation couples with the the potential of the object, and this is the reason why you have self-gravitating objects, because the scalar acts as a source for the Newtonian potential of the object itself. And solving this equation, you can find boson stars, Newtonian boson stars. So this MBS states for Newtonian boson stars, in which the mass of this object is proportional to the, to the field, and is basically given by summing all the masses of the small particles that forms the dark matter inside the halo. Here in the bottom, there is a plot in which you can, you can see for the solution that is going to be my, the background for my perturbation theory, so these Newtonian boson stars, profiles, both for the scalar field psi and for the potential view. As you see in the center, there is no cusp. This work became general, very general in the moment in which there is the, the realization that it was already done by uh, Guzman and Urena Lopez that studied first this kind of object in which you have that the schrodinger poisson solution has an invariant you can rescale all the quantities in the game the frequency of the boson star the potential the field with a value with a parameter lambda so once we solve for one boson star in a ground state there were no nodes in the in the plot of the field that i showed you then you solve for all of them if you just find this kind of if you just play with this scale lambda even the mass, for instance. When you change lambda, you're changing the frequency and you're changing, you're passing from a solution to another and you're changing the total mass of the object. So this makes the things very general because all the, the fluxes that I'm going to show you depends on these quantities. So solving for one in the ground state, you solve for all of them in the correct perturbation scheme. Typical masses, I was already saying that are around 10 to the 10 solar masses and scale of galaxies or the central part of a galaxy. If you are 
considering masses of 10 to the minus 22 electron volt for the scalar field. Then you can also relate, the, uh, in a classical way, the, the number of particles that are contained in Newtonian boson stars in this way. And you can see exactly that the mass is proportional to the number of particles that you have times the mass of each of the particles that are contained in the halo. Since we want to do some kind of dynamical study of it, we want to throw black holes, put binaries moving inside this, this kind of scalar object, we need to do some kind of perturbation theory. We want to do some kind of perturbation theory. And to do so, we need to, to plug a, a general perturbation that it can be induced by an external particle, for instance, and sum it over the background solution psi naught that is a Newton and Boson star that I showed you. And this is exactly the same. This has to be done exactly the same way for Newtonian potential because you're putting something that has a mass. So you are perturbing both the Newtonian potential and the scalar field of the background object. At first order in this perturbation, you, you, what you need to do is to solve the linearized Schrodinger Poisson system for the perturbation delta psi and delta u. And we are allowing the perturbation to be generated by an external particle. So we are, we are introducing this P as a general one particle, but you can sum over different particles and have a binary. So what we are saying, asking is, if I'm putting something inside this object, can I excite the background? To which extent, in which way? Can I find the energy, angular momentum that are radiated by this kind of excitations? Of course, you need some, some kind of boundary conditions. What we ask normally is regularity at the center and Sommerfeld at infinity. And with Sommerfeld, I mean that we want to just propagating waves that are not incoming from infinite. It's asymptotically flat, all this. To try to be the more, the more um, uh, clear, I added this slide in which I'm showing you which, are, which could be problems in our, in our analysis at least, which are the limit of validity of our perturbation scheme. On a side, we have the fact that, we, that as I was telling you, we, we have particles inside dark matter. We don't have a, really the space time of a black hole, but the space time, if you think about it, of a black hole that is inside a dark matter halo, that is several times larger than the typical radius of a black hole, it gives you two different scale in which physics, if you are neglecting the internal size of a black hole or of a star, you are not losing too much. This was already used in other in other in other studies, for instance, to find uh, by to find Mazzarilli that the, the, the gravitational radiation emitted by a black hole or or a particle plunging in a Schwarzschild space time. On the other side, we are we are having a perturbation theory over a perturbation theory. The background solution is. A Newtonian boson star. So it's a boson star in which we are plugging a Newtonian ansatz. So we are discard, discarding all the post Newtonian corrections. Now we are putting a particle that is perturbing the background. So the, the, the space time, the, the space time, the gravitational field potential of this particle that we are putting over the Newtonian boson star can't exceed, of course, the background, the background potential, but it has to be also larger. Then the first post Newtonian correction, there is this u naught square here. And this is normally found if the particle we are putting inside the dark matter halo are order 10 to the 4 solar masses. And this value can seem very large, but this is a, this is a static result. The, all the post Newtonian terms that we are neglecting are nearly statical, meaning that the dynamical uh, solutions, dynamical fluxes that we are finding because of moving black holes, for instance, this, our result are also valid for smaller masses and the one that is in, the, in this slide. Then we need to say, okay, which kind of sources we are having? Are we having a fast source, a fast, meaning a source that is moving very fast, for instance, uh, LIGO and LISA binaries, or we are having some kind of non-relativistic source, some, an example can be, um, can be the star that is orbiting, S2 that is orbiting Sagittarius A star. We are taking into account all of this. At the beginning, I didn't show you a real, uh, a huge and a real outlook of talk. Uh, what I, I'm doing it now, so I put some context. I hope that I motivated enough to try to, 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 to let you understand why we are doing this kind of study. 
And then, I don't know, I'm showing you what we are doing. We are perturbing with and without, with, uh, with and without a source. So the free perturbations are, serves to find the normal modes, the quasi-normal modes of oscillation of this kind of scalar structure. And then when we put some kind of perturbers, perturbers we, we are looking at the source perturbations. They can be of two case, of two, or two types. The static ones, for instance, a black hole that is placed at the center of a galaxy, and we know that this exists because of the image found by the Event Horizon Telescope, in which there is a black hole at the center of the galaxy that, can, that is sitting there statically, or an object that is moving through. And one of the motivation one, why one can be interested in black holes moving inside a central parsec of a galaxy is because of the Bekenstein paper in which he was saying that a uh, uh, non-spherical non gravitational collapse imparts a, a recoil velocity to a black hole of order of 100, 1,000, 100, more than 1,000 kilometers per second because some, angular, some, some momentum is emitted in that direction. So the black hole that is the outcome of the gravitational collapse is moving in the other to conserve the total momentum. These kind of kicks are there also for, for uh, for, uh, bi for, uh, for the outcome of uh, binary collisions. We have two black holes that are oscillating, there is some kind of energy emitting in a direction and momentum. The outcome can have a kick of 1,000, 2,000 kilometers per second. So we know that there are binaries that are collisions. So there's this highly probable that, is, that there are black holes that are piercing through the interior, interior part of a galaxy. And then if you have an interior environment, you can wonder what is really happening. And this is what I'm, I'm putting here in this animation by Anna Carvalho, in which I'm, we are putting this kind of shaded region that is the, the, that is the, the dark matter halo and this black dot that is piercing through. The black dot can go away in infinity, until infinity if it has a velocity that is large, but it can come back and, in an oscillatory motion, for instance. Then, in all the plethora of physics that we can, we can study with this kind of model, we can place a binary inside the dark matter halo and ask how low and high energy binaries are affected by this non-trivial environment. Let's start with the free perturbations. So sourceless perturbations. What we are studying here is basically the quasi normal modes of the object. So we are asking which are the proper modes of oscillations of the Newtonian boson stars. Do one of this number was found already by Guzman and Urania Lopez in 2004 for L equals zero. We found more of them. We found a larger number even for different kind of degree of the spherical harmonics L index here, not one, two. And one of the things that is important in here is that this modes are just normal. You don't see any complex part in this, in this any, any imaginary part in, this, in these numbers, because these are proper modes of oscillation that in principle they oscillate forever, meaning they don't extract energy from the background and they don't reach infinity. So we can't see it from here. I'm sitting here, something is happening inside the central part of the galaxy, I will not see these numbers arrive to me, arriving to me, these waves don't escape, because there is this gamma that acts as a screening mechanism if you're not energetic enough, you stay inside there. And what one, one can wonder, so there is some kind of energy that stays there and it can be deposited in the scholar and steer it, for instance. But on the other side, from the observational point of view, these, these are just normal modes. And uh, in a paper that didn't appear, I think yet, by Macedo and collaborators, these numbers that are found for Newtonian boson stars are valid in the proper limit of relativistic boson stars, meaning that if you correctly translate the Newtonian limit in the, in the relativistic one, you'll find that the relativistic numbers, proper modes, are going to go smoothly on these numbers that I'm showing you in this table. There are any questions at this point? If not, so, I'm going to go. I have, yes. I have a question. So, but it's actually about uh, your previous slide when you had that animation. So you're thinking about black holes piercing this uh, Newtonian boson star, but you'll also have lots of gas that, I mean, this is 
I mean, you have in mind uh, the object at the center of, of a galaxy, if, if I understand, so a supermassive object. You also have lots of gas falling in yes. because the, we see quasars and AGNs. So those would probably, that gas would probably accumulate in the center and, uh, and, and actually provide a much bigger black hole than the small perturber because the gas would accumulate there and probably at some point would collapse to, to a black hole. Do you have a, an intuition about what would happen? Did, did you think about it? Well, what, what I can tell you is the following. Um, what we are placing at the center of this kind of, of dark matter can be a black hole of 10 to the seven solar masses. And uh, what, what we are doing is, to th uh, is twofold. On a side, we are interested just in how the dark matter density changes, because there were already several studies by Bertone, Merritt, uh, Verde, in which they were finding that there should be a higher cusp in particle like uh, scenario if you place a, also a black hole at the center. But then there are also studies that tell you that this cusp is not there anymore because of scattering. So on a side, if the black hole is static at the center, is accreting, but in our, in our results, there is the next slide I'm gonna show you, the density is not changing too much. In another slide, I'm gonna show you that the black hole acts as a one-way membrane. So this gas that you're talking about uh, is flowing in and probably is flowing in, what is flowing in also is, uh, is the bottom star itself. So the bottoms are oscillate. So in principle, it falls in a black hole that is at the center, but the time scale of this is not very uh, relevant. Okay, th this, was my, this was my question. If you have a, an adiabatically growing black hole at the center, does that affect the quasi normal modes and the stability of this configuration? No, not a relevant time scale. I'm going to show you in three okay. slides. Thank you, Enrico. So moving forward, yes. See, this was the first thing that I was wanting to talk is static perturbation. So we have an object, so a black hole that is at the center of the galaxy, at the center of the dark matter halo. And the first thing that you want to see is how the density is changing. And the density in the center is proportional to the ratio between the central object, MP, and the mass of the Newtonian bottom stars. If we take into account that the perturbation scheme is valid for masses of black holes that are 10 to the minus four of the masses of the center of the, of the bottom star, then you can see that this number is always very small. So fuzzy model, like the one that I'm describing, don't predict a cusp, a spike on the, on the cusp at the center of the galaxies. And this is in, uh, in, um, in contrast with what was found by Gondol and Silk, for instance, uh, uh, talking about particle like dark matter models. But then we, we have no hair theorem. We know that there can be a Schwarzschild with hair in general relativity. So if we have a scalar, it will be either accreted or depleted by the black hole, the center of black hole. We don't have a static configuration with black holes and hair that are um, characteristic numbers of a black hole outside of the mass or its charge if you have Ryzen Nordstrom or the angular momentum if you have Cairn instead of Schwarzschild. So the scalar has to go somewhere. And one of the things that we wonder is how much, how much of the scalar is accreted by the black hole. And this is exactly uh, translated in the, in the question, what's the lifetime of a Newtonian bottom star that is accreted by a central black hole? So what, what we did in this is the following. We consider a one-way membrane placed at the center of the, of, the, of the dark matter halo. Even if it's not a black hole, just a one-way membrane at R, R plus. And with several toy models, we proved that the energy that is falling in, that is equal for conservation in principle of, of momentum and of the energy that is falling out, it is E dot in, has this kind, of, this kind of mathematical expression that is proportional to how big is the radius, the mass of the bottom star and the mass of the scalar field. But then if this, mem this membrane is not just a membrane, but is a, the sur is a event horizon of a black hole, then this R star, R plus is the transversal radius. And using a work of Uru that tells you the low frequencies wave are poorly absorbed, we can say, we can relate the energy absorbed by the black hole. So how much energy and mass the black hole is gaining, how much is accreted, uh, we, we can relate it with the energy that is falling in because of the scalar field that is oscillating with frequency gamma. And typical time scale of this is very huge. 
for black holes, um, for, for, for boson stars, sorry, of uh, masses tend to the 10 solar masses and key that is uh, this factor is their mass ratio between the black hole and the, and the halo that is around 10 to the four, these numbers is telling you that accretion is, uh, is uh, negligible. And this is also a, a safe pinpoint for our perturbation scheme. It's not breaking down at, at, with, the, with the static black hole at the center. Passing to another kind of perturbation, now we can have something that is dynamical. We can have, we can dive into dark matter. And one of the motivations that I was already saying before is about the back inside recoil velocity, 300 kilometers per second, that is imparted to black holes after gravitational collapse. But then one can also go through simple stars that are moving through in the universe and they're passing in the central part of the galaxy and asking, which is the interaction with the surrounding, can be can, can give you some kind of observ or astrophysical observable consequences, for instance, through the, the gravitational drag that is feeling. The, the, this, can be, this kind of dive into dark matter can be done in two ways. The motion can be unbound or oscillatory, depends if your velocity is above or below the, escape, the typical escape velocity of a dark matter. Hello, in exactly the same way it, hap it, it happens for our planet. Our perturbation schemes allow us to evaluate the spectral energy that is emitted, the, the, emitted, the linear momentum that is emitted, and thanks to this, we can relate it with the energy lost by the perturber that is piercing through the dark matter halo. And this is, this is useful because we can evaluate dynamical friction. In, in simple words, the dynamical friction is basically due to the fact that if you move in an environment and you are massive or, or fast, but let's say that you are massive compared to your environment, then what is happening is that as long as you move, you are calling all the particles to you, but you are moving the other particles not. So they are going back to you and you are inducing a wake of particles behind you, but they pile up together and this slows you down. And this causes a momentum loss in a massive object that is moving. This was already found by Chandrasekhar and in other cases. In our study, we can relate the energy emitted by the black hole that is moving Yet this energy in scalar waves that is emitted by the black hole that is moving inside our matter halo, we can relate it with the momentum that is lost by, lost by the object itself. And this is summarized in this plot. So in this plot, what we are having is the energy emitted by a black hole that is moving through a dark matter halo of mass MBS, the energy lost by the black hole, and the momentum that is radiated that is negative is what is minus here. And thanks to this, we can estimate what's, for instance, the lifetime of a black hole in oscillatory motion inside the dark matter halo. So one, one can wonder, for instance, uh, if I have a black hole that is moving inside the center of a galaxy and is slowing down only because of dynamical friction we discover. There are other kinds of dynamical frictions that one can take into account. There can be some kind of gas, there can be, there can be stars, that are slowing it down. And what we, our answer to this is that if we are just looking at purely dynamical friction because of this, of dark matter, then the time scale is around the Hubble time. These four masses are 10 to the five solar masses. So th this number can seem large, but for supermassive black holes, this is just a fraction of the, um, time, of, of the proper time for dynamical friction of black holes that are slowing down because of a stellar distribution. So imagine that you have n, n stars, and they, Wallandris and Merritt found that if you are slow, a black hole is slowing down because of the interaction with the stars inside the galaxy core, this number, T star, is what you are finding from this kind of study. Our dynamical friction is just a fraction of it. So it's not, if you want to do a real, um, estimate of how dynamical friction works for black hole, you should need to, to take into account also dark matter effects. This is the bottom line of this slide. Finally, I'll go with binary study. First thing before describing the binary is, I think it's worth to say that this kind of scalar field works as a kind of viscous fluid. 
what, what do I mean? Imagine that you have a binary is moving inside a cloud. The first impression that one can have is the faster you move, the more you are exciting your environment. Well, this is not the case for, for dark matter halos made by massive scholars. You have a typical frequency that is the mass mu of the scalar field, and you are exciting the scholars. Ex with exciting, I mean you are emitting more scholars than infinity. You are depleting scholar by next to you, if you are a black hole. Um, this is happening stronger if your typical velocities, if your typical energy is comparable with the, the mu, the rest energy of the massive particle, the massive scholars. If you're faster, you emit less. So with this, I am already telling you that sources, so, um, sources like uh, binaries for LIGO that moves, let's say, faster than the, so the, than the LISA kind of, uh, of binaries, so they emit it with a larger frequency from the gravitational wave spectrum, these objects are going to emit less color. So the effect of the environment is going to be smaller. But still, what I'm showing you here is what is happening for binaries in general. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to high frequencies. And I'm doing it because we can do everything analytical. So this formula is the energy lost by a binary that is inside a dark matter halo as a function of its frequency of oscillations. So this is a very compact expression. We have another similar for, for uh, not, high, uh, not high frequency. And the features of this is that, first of all, it, it converges exponentially with L. So L equals zero is going to be probably the, the most, uh, um, OK, in this case, uh, yeah, L equals zero is going to be the most, and L equal, but L equal one, L equal two. In some cases, if you are considering that the binary is made by two equal masses, then you don't have all the, all the L. You just have even L, for instance. One thing that is worth to, to wonder is, OK, I have a binary. I'm emitting scalar fields. But if after a very short time scale, the binary is still going, one, the black holes are going one around the other, but I emitted all the scalars next to me, then there is no more interaction with the scalar field. So the depletion time scale by black hole binaries, is it comparable or not with the, the typical time scale of orbiting of binary black holes? And the answer is that this kind of depletion time is larger of the Hubble time. So in the mo if you have two black holes going one next to the around the other, the scalar field basically stays there. Your, our perturbation scheme is valid even for this case. We are not depleting all the possible scalar field that is around black holes with some kind of typical radius. So we are considering a sphere of 10 wavelength, for instance. Uh, Lorenzo? Yes. We have 10 minutes left. OK, thank you, Nicole. Okay. So I'm, already, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, one of the last things that I'm showing you is that Okay, we have scalar field emitted by black holes. Well, nice. There is an extra channel of radiation. And the first thing, how this compares with the cloud quadrupole formula. Basically, how the, the scalar field, that is an extra channel of radiation, compares with the typical radiation because of two black holes that are orbiting one around the other. And the numbers in this kind of and taylor experiment are not extremely low. You can see that for for uh, for uh, object like for instance s2 with an orbit of 16 years and typical masses of the scalar always 10 to the minus 22 electron volt this number is not very small and all these powers are very uh, are very large so as soon as you play a bit with the numbers staying in the perturbation scheme of course you increase the mass of the of the of the boson star of the dark matter halo for instance then you can play with this number and having that the energy lost by scalar waves can be comparable with the quadruple, so the gravitational waves emitted by black holes inside these non-trivial environments. And finally, in the moment in which you have LIGO and LISA sources, you want to know, for instance, how much the gravitational wave phase is changing because you have an extra channel of radiation. These kind of studies were already done also for dark matter uh, years ago, but this is slightly different 
compared to other, other examples in literature, because we are not modifying the black hole space-time. We are considering that the black holes are just point-like particles, because we have a typical wavelength of the scalar field that is way larger than the scale of the black hole. And we are looking at how the extra channel of radiation, E dot lost, that is the energy loss in scalars, adding to the usual quadruple energy emitted by black holes by black hole binaries, how these summing up these two energies, the rate of energy, is changing the phase of, of the gravitational waves. And this is done in this delta epsilon. And this is a value that is, is proportional to, for instance, the the scalar field at the center, the scalar field in the center means just how much scalar there is. So the density of dark matter at the center of the galaxy. And this number is, seems very small, so seems hopeless to detect by Lisa, for instance. But it's also true that I'm, I'm being um, strict with the, with the numbers that I'm giving you because I'm choosing a mass of 10 to, to the minus 22 electron volt because I want to be coherent with all the rest of the talk. But if you play a bit with these numbers, it's a, a very simple exercise. If you put 10 to the minus 19 here on the masses, the mass of the scalar and a, um, a dark matter halo of 10 to the 10 solar masses instead of 10 to the 9, then you get that this dephasing can be up to 10 to the 8, minus 8. Meaning that if you have proper sensitivity in your gravitational wave observatories, then you can possible measure this dephase because of the of, of dark matter. This correction in principle have, is a, a minus 6 pi in order. That is, that this gives you a bit of an hint of what I was saying about the fact that it's a viscous fluid. And the closer you are to the frequent, typical frequency oscillation of the object, the more you're going to emit and have an impact on, the, on your physics. And in this, in this slide, I'm just giving you a pictorial way of seeing what I'm saying. So you have a binary at the center here. You have a binary at the center of the galaxy. It is an equatorial slice of the galaxy. And I'm considering black holes with period one day and masses, equal masses 10 to the six solar masses, each of the black holes. And the, the first kind of scalar that you're emitting is just a quadruple that has this kind of shape in which you have that this white part is where the scalar field is larger and the black where is lower. And you can see that black holes are depleting this color field from uh, nearby space. So we, what, what we did is try to stir and shake dark matter. So we, we stir and shake. Uh, Agent 07 was saying shake and not stir. We are trying to shake it and see if there is some kind of imprint in the, uh, the, this massive color field scenarios. And I'm, I'm leaving you here with the main contributions uh, with a recap of our work, and I'm open for questions. And that's all for me. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, for the very nice, nice talk. Um, so, yeah, we are open for questions. Are there any questions? Uh, from anyone? I have a question, Nicola, but uh, if others want to go first, since I asked a couple already. But if yeah. nobody... If nobody if the, asks, uh, you can... Uh, yeah, so I have actually two questions. So so, <coughs> so the energy lost to... So when, it's, when you compute the lost energy, if I understand, well, that's the energy lost to, to this viscous fluid through dynamical friction. Is that what, what you mean by... Is what we mean by he lost is the energy yeah. lost by the object that is moving. Yeah, and that is lost to where? To dynamical friction, and therefore it heats up the, the background? So th there are two different, there are two different uh, things. So one is the energy that is radiated. So the energy that is radiated is carried out by the rest energy of the particle and the kinetic energy of the scalars that are emitted. There is the energy so, that is so lost. Th th this is where I'm a bit confused, I'm sorry. So, what, so you have this binary moving in the scalar field. Yes. And then how do you produce waves of the scalar field? I mean, if there is no direct coupling between the, the, the black uh, holes. And the, the, the coupling is because the, um, the perturbation in the gravitational uh, potential mm -hmm. feels, feels the particles. If yeah. you remember that there was a, the, the Poisson equation that is sourced by the scalar, that is sourced mm -hmm. by this perturber. 
So when mm -hmm. you have uh, those are the the waves. Uh, okay, so you have um, yeah, I see the sound waves of the scalar field essentially produced by. The, uh, basically, is 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 that? Okay. In fact, in fact, there was there was some kind of confusions once with the uh, people asking about ah, but no, it was no hair theorem. So black holes only emit scalars. In this case, you are sourcing the Newtonian yeah, potential. But, but that is the same as the dynamical friction because it's those waves, as you you said at some point that cause the dynamical friction. I mean, if you look at how then, I mean, I, I'm confused about, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I mean, when you compute dynamical friction in, in of a perturbed in a fluid, indeed you, I mean, you, you compute the sound waves and that it's the Newtonian attraction of those sound waves uh, that pull the object back and this is i think at some point you you, you mentioned in the case of particles the particles accumulate yeah. behind your perturber i mean it's the same with the sound wave so i'm a bit confused if that energy lost if, i can okay, well, okay let's let me try to rephrase in this way so uh in the moment in which you have energy emitted you can have two things because in principle we don't know who's emitting what exactly. if it's and what what we found is the following by energy conservation the energy lost by the perturber plus the variation in energy of the background configuration there is some kind of heat that you were that you were mentioning mm -hmm. before this the sum of those is giving you the s to uh, e be equal for conservation of energy to the energy mm -hmm. at infinity but in principle this variation of energy in the background is up to second order in the scalar in the perturbation in the scalar so it can be very complicated to, to measure. Mm -hmm. But for Newtonian boson stars, you can use another theorem and the conservation of, of particle and connect how many particles are emitted at infinity with the, lost, with the loss of mass of the background. And thanks to this, with only radiated uh, quantities, you can infer how much was the momentum lost by the object in this okay, moment. Okay, I see. Okay, well, thank you. The, the other question I had was like more speculative. I mean, you, you talk, I mean, these are these cores, galactic cores, and some people call them axion stars. What, what happens when, when two galaxies merge? I mean, did you, do you think about, uh, uh, I mean, because that's the obvious way in which you could test this scenario, because here you have in mind this um, static or quasi-static Newtonian configuration and the perturber, but galaxies merge. So the, these cores, these Newtonian boson star cores, they they would collide, and um, and and, uh, and that is what nanogram, for instance, uh, can observe. The, the frequency would be in the nanohertz. But do you have a feeling what what could happen there if there would be any differences from from black holes, from supermassive black holes? So what I what I would what I would say is this. Okay, we are studying we are just studying static bosons. We are not having either rotating boson mm, stars. Yeah. So in a, in a sense, you can have first of all that this dark matter center can can spin on its own. Um, on a side, the studies about galaxies merging, galaxies merger, were already say, saying how how the from a spike at the center of dark matter, I arrive to a core because mm -hmm. there is some kind of scatterings and black holes that are orbiting, a supermassive black hole on each galaxy in principle. So if you have two galaxies with supermassive black holes, then I think you can have more imprint by the fact that there are two different trivial environments that are also- yeah, so, But your idea is that there, is, there are both these cores, these uh, axion cores and the supermassive black holes. That's the, well, we, we, you, can, you can have different cases because you can have even, yeah. even galaxies with having just a core and not having a supermassive black hole at the center. Mm -hmm. So there were already different studies about this, but they were more focusing on the effect of the black holes on the dark matter density to try to see mm -hmm. if there is some kind of annihilation because they were all, yeah. all particle like physics oriented. On the other side, probably the scale of the problems are very different because there is on a side the black holes that are colliding in some kind of Lisa band, for instance, mm -hmm. but then the environment that lives on a completely different compactness and scales. Yeah, so the, so the compactness of these cores is what the compactness of a dark matter halo or are they smaller? I mean, this is something I, you, you probably said it, but I... I, I these, it. these are, these should be com completely Newtonian, the number right now. Okay, so they're like, uh, 
so their size is uh, is what yeah no the company is very is absolutely absolutely negligible the positive okay. corrections i see okay well then there is no effect uh, you agree, you agree. I, I i don't think no. No, that, that, that's good. So the, there's no way you can falsify that with, with none of the other or similar experiments. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Um, are there further questions? Me. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, Hi, Lorenzo. Thank you so much Hi, for Miguel. your talk. Hi, hey, Miguel. Very nice talk, by the way. Uh, just a um, maybe silly question, but I have a doubt. Uh, what do you mean with benchmark for numerical relativity simulation? Yes. Okay. Thanks for the question. I left it in the contributions, but so the thing is, when you're doing numerical relativity, I'm not a numerical relativist, so it it can be probably you know way better than me. But the scales of the problem, if they are very different, that can cause you a problem when you are trying to understand what is going on. So in this sense, if you are having, if you are having uh, uh, extreme mass ratios inside uh, a, an environment, this can be also even more, more non-trivial. But on the other side, we are already computing, for instance, uh, the energy emitted by a black hole piercing through. So as, as Davis, Thion, or Ruffini found uh, the energy emitted by a point-like particle inside a Schwarzschild black hole, that, that's the benchmark for numerical relativists that, does, that do head-on collision. Yeah. So in the same sense, when numerical relativity, relativity simulation with the boson star cores comes out, there is already a comparison with the energy emitted by a single black hole piercing through a Newtonian configuration. That's the sense ah. that I'm giving. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Ah. Thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, I think there is time for one last question. Uh, if no one else want, wants to ask something, I have a curiosity. So, Please. given that so you, you're studying all this model uh, of universe where scalar fields are allowed, but I wanted to ask you: Did, did you try and check because w when you consider uh, the perturbation of this uh, Newtonian boson starts uh, given by a point particle, uh, are you assuming that the mass of this point particle can depend on the scalar field as well. So like imagining there is a, a scalar charge also for the small particle or this is not doable. I see what you I see what you mean. So uh, we don't we are not looking at that. But but uh, boson stars are the product of solving uh, Schrodinger Poisson or Einstein and Gordon systems in general relativity with exotic matter. So if you have modification to that, you or a more complicated potential that is coupling the scalar field, for instance, with Ricci, so you go to some kind of alternative theory, then you can have, you, you should find the proper boson star solution for that theory, because then probably you are back reacting if you are adding more terms in the, in the Lagrangian, even in the back, at the background level. So just adding a charge afterwards can be a bit dangerous because probably the object that you are solving is not exactly what the theory asks to be solved, even at, at zero order. Yeah, yeah, I see. No, because I, I was thinking something like you have two, I don't know, a, a small, a, a compact boson star rather than a black hole moving through uh, your Newtonian boson star. But even this, there, this but, but only, boson star yeah. is carrying a, a scalar charge. This is what I had in mind. Uh, I see, but they interact only through the first through Newtonian potential. At at first order, they interact only with the with the gravi average gravitational potential that is around. So the boson star will not see the fact that the outside object is a boson star. We are putting a point like particle exactly for this. In principle, the scale of this is different. So if you put a neutron star, a boson star. Myself, a ball yeah. black hole, the outcome should be the same. The outcome should, at, at least at the disorder. The outcome should no, no, I, I see, I see, I see. Um, uh, I was, yeah. No, okay. Thanks for the for the reply. So I think we can. Thanks, Lorenzo, again for the very Thanks nice talk. Thanks to you.